Le? That's fine. We're all here now. Okay. 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 Jude, you can do what you need to do. We're all ready to go. Okay, we're live, we're live, we're live. Hello and welcome to the Global Youth Mental Health Awareness Show, where we have open conversations with the youth about mental health. Thank you. Where we have open conversations with the youth about mental health. I'm your host, Katinda Dollar, author of The Big Comeback and founder of the Confidence and Self-Esteem Academy and one of Jim Hur's special board advisors. In today's show, we are blessed to be in the presence of three amazing panelists. And our first panelist is Ambassador Kibe Edwin Gitao. Um, Edwin is a certified addiction psychologist, founder, director at Uhai Center, and a global goodwill ambassador at their um, Jim Hart as well. Hello and welcome to the show, Edwin. Hello, everybody. Good morning, afternoon, evening. It's a pleasure to be with you this time. Thank you very much. Thank you. And our second panelist is Mehmet Kavlagkoglu. Um, he's a youth mental advocate. Hello and welcome to the show, Mem. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And our third panelist is Ismail Ghazali Bangura. He's a regulatory analyst at Pharmacy Board of Sierra Leone. Ministry of Health and Sanitation. Hello and welcome to the show, Ismail. Hello, thanks for having me. It was a great pleasure to be here. Thank you, thank you. Now, before we begin, I'd like to ask, how are we feeling today? I'm feeling good and wonderful, and you? I'm doing fantastic. How about right. Mem? Yeah, feeling, feeling pretty good today. Um, it's It's late over here in uh, Adelaide, South Australia. So just um, trying to stay warm, but yeah, feeling very good about tonight. Thank you. What about Edwin? How are you feeling today? Thank you very much. I'm feeling very happy. It's been a while since I was last in this show, but I'm, I'm really happy. It's lunchtime here in Nairobi, Kenya. So uh, yeah, it's lunchtime. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome. Well, I'm feeling fabulous, but we are in lockdown from tonight. Oh, from now, actually, eight o'clock in Melbourne um, PM time. So we're back in lockdown. I know everybody is a bit, you know, getting used to this, but I guess we'll just get on with the show. And hopefully if you're watching this show today, we are here to talk about substance abuse and young people. And our guest today will be giving us a bit of an insight about why, what, where, and when, and how you can also get help. So as we begin this show, I'll go to you, Edwin. What drives young people towards substance abuse and substance use as well? Uh, thank you, thank you very much, Katinda. First is uh, to say hi to all members present, those who are following us on uh, uh, our social media platforms. And uh, today's topic is addressing the use and abuse of substance substances, alcohol, drug, and substances, which we normally call psychoactive substances, which affect our psychology. And in most cases, uh, we fail to understand what is driving our young people. And let's, let's talk about young people because this is the beginning. This is where we, if we are to start preventing, should start with our youngsters. And uh, in most cases, you'll find that these youngsters they just use substances to get that euphoric feeling, to get uh, a, 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 as a leisure so that they can feel good. They do it to, 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 feel, uh, to feel better. By feeling better, I mean, uh, maybe they are battling with something, some challenges in life, and they are really challenged and they really want to feel better than the experience that they have been going through. So they do it to feel good, to feel better. Other than for pleasure, other than for leisure, other than for having fun, they just want to feel better out of some pressure that is happening in their lives. Uh, it's also common to find that uh, these youngsters, they'll do the experimentation. They'll do, uh, uh, when they see other elders doing it, 
they, they want to experiment and they, they really don't know the, the possible outcome. And that's why we are here today so that we can as well know uh, what are the consequences once you start using substances. Others, they do it to seek attention. Others, they, they do it to fit in a certain cluster or a certain category of peers or, you know, they, they just want to be associated, to, to, be, to, to, to be associated with peers who, are, who belong to a certain category or to a certain uh, 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 level. The other one is about, uh, they are doing this to compete. They are doing this out of competition. And also, they are doing this because they don't have the information. When they see glamorous advertisements on social media, when they see it on print and uh, uh, television, the, the, the visual media, then those glamorous advertisements, you know for sure when, when, when we get adverts, adverts on uh, probably say alcohol, say cigarettes, and they find like there is, that is what life is all about. So they are misinformed. They don't have the information. Basically because substances like alcohol, substances like uh, uh, nicotine through cigarettes, they are socially and culturally accepted. They are things that we found way before they've been in use. So they don't find anything, uh, anything, any problem while using them. So this is why we need such platforms, Katinda. And also we have a challenge of some people use these substances because, because they have some mental illnesses, psychiatric disorders. When the mood is low, this person wants to use a substance to elevate the mood. Or when the mood is too high, they just want to calm down. And so it's a varied, there are varied uh, reasons as to why our young people use substances. But it's good to mention all of them so that we know where we belong, especially the mental illnesses, the psychiatric disorders, bipolar, uh, or, or what do you call it, uh, anxiety disorder. They use substances so that they can contain the feeling in them. Thank you, Katinda. Thank you. Thank you for that. And what about Mem? What do you think, what could you add on that? What drives young people towards substance use and abuse? Yeah, thank you. Um, Edwin, very comprehensive answer. I think you cover most bases. All, all I'll pretty much add is um, when it comes to substance use and abuse and the social norms that surround that, from a young age, especially in Australia, um, there, there seems to be a drinking culture ever present. So like Edwin mentioned, when these young people see their, um, see the older generations partaking in activities, um, socially drinking, in their mind, they start painting a picture of certain habits or behaviours that they may also elicit themselves. So from a young age, they start thinking, um, after Friday work, I might just go or, or I see my parents go to the pub for a drink. Maybe that's something that I should be doing. So it starts as this curiosity, which over time, they start to uh, potentially take steps to actually test for themselves or experiment. So once they've... Um, um, once they've um, actually experienced that euphoric feel, uh, feeling that Edwin's talking about, they can understand that, hey, this, um, this substance can actually make me feel better if I'm experiencing low mood or negative emotions. So you can sort of see how over time that habit um, may manifest in other ways and cause a myriad of problems. So whilst they could be, um, you know, experimenting with substances, other challenges in their life may cause... Uh, you know, their mental health to decline. So then they start using that substance to actually remedy that. But in turn, it's actually um, alleviating the problem, making it worse. So um, based on my observations, there's, you know, they, they utilize it as a coping mechanism, young people, um, but it all starts from a younger age where they develop that curiosity. Um, and then once they get that feeling or that um, happy feeling in their brain, the chemical reaction, then um, it becomes, yeah, a, a longer term problem. Thank you, thank you. What about Ismail? Oh, okay, thank you. So give a, an addendum to that. The excessive use of these psychoactive drugs like alcohol, tobacco, painkiller drugs, when taken illegally without medication, can cause psychosocial and emotional, well, and emotional effect to the users. And uh, for me, what I think drives this youth um, towards substance abuse is curiosity, like what the other panelists have just mentioned. Curiosity in the sense on 
When interacting with these drug addicts, the non-drug users always get first-hand experience or information from the drug addicts about the way they feel when they take these drugs illegally. So they too become excited to know if they take these drugs, they'll get the same mutual feeling. So they become curious to take these illegal drugs. Another factor which I think drives youth towards substance abuse is peer group coordination or pressure. Interacting in an environment or society where the cohorts are drug addicts or drug misusers, you are always influenced to take these drugs illegally to attain a desired feeling. And when taking these drugs illegally, it causes physical damage to the, the individuals like um, mental disorders, uh, long health chronic problems, cause accidents to high rate of abnormality. And another issue, another factor which I think drives you towards substance abuse or misuse is stress. Emotional stress from other individuals, from workplaces, from relationship at home, also drives you towards substance misuse. And finally, I think emotional struggles also lead this issue towards misusing these psychoactive drugs. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's You're a good welcome. insight. I mean, yeah. So there's a lot, a lot, a lot there to um, to consider why young people get driven to do substance abuse. I know. Just to summarize, you know, peer pressure is one thing because they want to belong, they want to feel they fit in, which is mm -hmm. one thing I know we've seen a lot across the board. So moving on, what is the correlation between mental ill, mental ill health and substance abuse? Ma'am, would you like to give us some insight on that? Yeah, um, I guess you need to consider a few things when looking at this question. Um, the way we define substance abuse is uh, how does it impact on the young person's functioning, their day-to-day -day operation? To understand substance abuse in that manner, um, there, there are many factors. Um, is there a presence of mental ill health? Is, is that person supported? Do they have connections? Um, are they linked in with a service? Are they currently studying? So once you start unpacking these different variables, you can understand that if a young person is at risk or more vulnerable um, than their counterpart, then the presence of a substance will actually have more of a profound impact on their well-being than someone who has support mechanisms in place or support um, people. So the, I guess it, it comes back to um, education as well from a young age and how we actually prepare these young people um, who start experimenting with substances who aren't maybe self-aware or don't understand how their emotions interplay with their mood and functioning. So I guess if, if I come, if I bring it back to the question, how the correlation between um, mood and substance abuse, then you're probably looking at if a young person has underlying issues, mental ill health or other trauma related um, considerations, the presence of substances, including alcohol and other drugs will actually uh, impact their ability to undergo certain psychotherapy um, to help them uh, move past that in their, in their journey. So it can have a negative impact based on the risk factors associated with the young person. Right, thank you. Edwin, what would you like to add to that? What's the uh, correlation between mental ill health and substance abuse? Thank you, thank you very much, Kajinda, and also to me for, for that input. I'll just build on what he has just said that uh, mental health and uh, substance abuse, there is a correlation because the moment you, you, you start using, first, let me say this, substances, they are, they are, they are, they are categories where we have the use, the abuse, and the addiction. They, you undergo three levels. The use, the abuse, and the, uh, the, the addiction, which is also a mental disorder. Addiction is also a mental disorder. So what we are talking, we are addressing here is the psychoactive uh, uh, manifestation of these substances once you start uh, using them. And they go and affect the functioning of the brain. They go and affect, they interfere with the process, the processes the, the chemistry in the brain. And uh, research has confirmed that for those people that you find who are using substances, uh, 30 to 60% of them, they have underlying mental condition. 30 to 60% of persons with substance disorders, they have underlying condition. 
And this is the interference. This is the correlation that we are talking about. The moment you smoke a cigarette, which is a stimulant, it will elevate, it will make your brains to run fast. It's, it's a, under the categorization of drugs, we have those drugs that are stimulants, we have those drugs that are, that are depressants, we have those drugs that are hallucinogens. And for the stimulants, they'll make you to feel elevated. They'll keep you awake, you'll not get sleep all through. And what happens when you have an anxiety disorder in you and you use a cigarette or you use marijuana, which is weed or bangi, uh, of course, these will have a psychoactive effect on your system, on your brain system. And this is the correlation that we are talking about. When somebody is experiencing a major depressive disorder, bipolar disorder, when somebody is having a post-traumatic stress disorder and he engages in these substances, definitely, there'll be challenges. Now, what should be uh, our point, uh, our biggest point of concern is knowing that substance use, uses of psychoactive substances can automatically lead to mental illnesses. And equally, the vice versa is true, mental illnesses can lead to substance abuse. So there is, it, there is that symbiotic relationship whereby you find for somebody who is uh, abusing, say for example, nicotine, this person is trying to elevate the mood. He was in a depressive mood. Or somebody who is in a hyper mood is trying to manage the problem using a depressant to calm them down. It is come to our attention that even the, 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 the medication that you use for depression, for, I mean, as depressants, they are being abused just because there is that, uh, mind altering uh, effect of the substances. So uh, this is what we refer to as comorbidity. When somebody is having an underlying mental condition and there is an overlapping, there is another, you, you use another substance which you become hooked to, it becomes a psycho. You use it to calm down the nerves and or you use it to lift up your, yet you have an underlying mental problem. So we should be very careful. When we see somebody who is having a, a mental problem using substances, let's not only look, at, let's not see the, 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 the presentation that he's giving. Let's know that this is a sick person. Let's know that this person needs special attention. That's why now the psychiatrists and the psychologists, they'll need to work hand in hand to try and solve this problem. And if it is done concurrently, the better. Warning to the youth, beware that this is happening. And that's why we have uh, an outburst. We have an, an outcry globally on substance use and mental health issues. Thank you and back to you, Katinda. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Edwin, for that. And now, Ismail, are you there? Ismail? Yeah, I'm here. Yes, what would I'm you like to add? I'm here. OK, what yes, What would you please. like to add? We All can't right. see you. Now, now, as you, sorry. Okay. okay. Now, as we rightly know, mental illness is a disorder diagnosed by a specifically psychiatric that do interfere with an individual cognitive, social, and emotional abilities. And uh, substance abuse is the illegal use or excessive use of psychoactive drugs that affects an individual psych, uh, that affects an individual psychosocial, emotional, and physical well-being. Now, both mental illness and social abuse are directly or indirectly related to each other with greater effect to the users. Now, mental illness occurs when an individual state of mind is not in a deep standard form. Now, there are different types of mental illness with varying degrees of severity, which include eating disorder, bipolar disorders, as my colleague just mentioned, and uh, general anxiety disorder. Substance abuse, on the other hand, occurs when an individual takes drugs illegally to attain a desired feeling. And uh, the different types of substance abuse, substances we are do abuse include marijuana, commonly called cannabis sativa, alcohol, tobacco. These addictive substances do have nicotine that cause abuse among individuals. 
Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes. Okay. So what are some of the side effects of substance abuse, ma'am? Yeah, thank you. It's a great question. Um, we often consider the impact that it might have on the young person themselves in terms of their psychology and their well-being, but we also need to consider some of the practical implications that arise based on substance abuse. So some of those might look like the impact that substance abuse has on your relationships, and some of these are actually going to be interlinked. So financial pressure um, or financial strain that results from substance abuse um, generally speaking, prolonged exposure or use of some of these substances, substance, substances sorry, will affect your executive functioning. So it affects your ability, ability to actually um, be able to make decisions uh, weighing up you know, the pros and the cons. So if a young person is um, a regular user of substances, then their ability to actually foresee the consequences of their actions will be impaired. So some of that may be um, they... they their sense of empathy is actually hindered because of regular use. So when they're interacting with their friendship groups or their families, they're not able to empathize in, in the same way that they were previously doing. Um, other implications would be the financial strain if they're regularly purchasing tobacco, um, for stress relief or alcohol or going out on the weekends, um, binge drinking. There's a bit of a research in Australia around binge drinking and the culture that surrounds that. Um, the other thing that it might impact is your motivation and engagement with work or school and how you um, are able to prepare yourself for that day in, day out. So someone who regularly uses alcohol may find it difficult to wake up in the morning, may find that um, they, their mood has been affected so they no longer wish to pursue goals that they previously um, were considering. So these are some of the secondary effects that substance abuse might have um, on, on the young person uh, outside of health you know, implications, you know, high risk of certain um, chronic illness, um, obesity. Um, so it is, yeah, it is a lot to unpack, but those are some brief ones that people might consider. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. So what about Ismail? What do you think are your, some of the side effects of substance abuse? Okay, thank you very much. Um, there are the long-term effects of substance abuse will vary depending on the drug being abused. Now, some of the physical effects of the substance abuse include heart attacks when taking excessive drugs and uh, damage to all organ systems, especially liver. And uh, it caused accidents among these youth when taking these drugs excessively due to constant absent-minded. And also, it also caused strokes among the individuals. And one of the factors that we should consider greatly that do affect this individual is. Thank you, thank you. Edwin, what are some the side thank effects you, of substance you. abuse? Thank you, thank you very, very much. Uh, it's a good uh, question. What are... Okay, I think we can't hear you. Uh, Edwin, we lost you, we can't hear you. Uh, the, the effects, the, the, the in substance effects. But I would want us to look at uh, four, 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 rather five different aspects that lead to, or rather the, the, the consequences of substance abuse. We have the social effects. What are the consequences socially? We find that there is uh, high levels of insecurities, high level of antisocial behaviors, high levels of you know, it becomes a, a, a social problem, a societal problem, whereby even it, it, there, there is no advancement, there is no development in the social uh, uh, circles of that person. Secondly, we look when we look at it uh, economically, the economic aspect, this person becomes a liability. This person becomes unproductive. If this person was to be uh, to be employed somewhere, instead of being productive, you'll find he's registering a lot of absenteeism. Workplace accidents are happening. And this reduces the productivity and the economic uh, required, what was expected is not reached. The targets are not uh, attained. Then there is also the medical aspect. This is what my brother Ismail was addressing. The medical aspect, you find that this person is all the vital organs from the moment that drug was administered. First, it alters the mental wellness. 
it goes and affects the lungs. It goes and affects the liver and the intestines and the respiratory system, the medical aspect. You find there are so many diseases, including uh, cancers and what have you, pancreatitis, you know, all that, the medical aspect, these are the consequences. And eventually these will also affect the economic well-being of that person and the family related to that person because they have to raise funds to uh, address the problem. Then the issue of uh, the political effect. You find that we lack leaders. We fi you find that you have people who could have, who, are, who had very promising careers, who had very promising, uh, 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 what do you call it? They, they had a, a career that was well planned and they were about to achieve it. The moment you start using substances, because it's going to affect your mental wellness, decision-making like uh, my brother Matt mentioned, the decision making and all the faculties in the brain, they are affected, you become a liability. Politically, you've seen, and especially from where I come from, you'll find politicians, they use these substances to influence masses, and it is very wrong. So this, uh, these are some of the, 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 the effects, the long-term and short-term effects. You find people who, are, who, have, who had to undergo treatment in a rehabilitation facility. Whereas this person was supposed to be completing studies, especially the youth, it's a big challenge. And we should know the moment you start using substances, initial, the, first, the very first time, it is usually fun. It is usually voluntary. It is usually a decision that you've made. But coming out of it, my dear brothers, coming out of substance abuse, especially when you go to the full cycle of addiction, Coming out of it is not as easy as you think. And in fact, one out of five persons recover out of substances. So the best thing is to abstain. For those who have not started, don't. For those who have started, starting, start the measures to stop it. Thank you and back to you, Katinda. Thank you. Thank you, Edwin. Well, the whole, I think the message here is don't touch any substance abuse because the That's side right. effects it's it's addictive it's hard to stop and it's really a, not a good healthy cycle to be in especially when mm -hmm. life gives us all these other pressures you know like we've got mental health we've got covid we've got all these things that just add up every day as life challenges so if you're doing substance that's another extra challenge in your life which is another problem that you're adding to yourself so if it's a it's a choice you make so if you're watching this if you just joined us we're talking about substance abuse and young people Please click share, comment, invite your friends to watch and ask questions because that's why we do shows like this, to encourage you, inspire you and inform you and give you a platform where you can actually seek help if you really wanted to because we're not just here to inform only, we're also here to support you if you have any problems or challenges with substance abuse, with mental health, mental illness. And we've got a lot of specialists on this platform who can actually answer some of your questions. Now, moving forward, what are some healthy ways the youth can cope with challenges as opposed to substance abuse? Mem. Oh, unmute yourself, please. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so I currently work in a school as, a, as the wellbeing leader, as a school counselor. So it's, um, it's an interesting challenge. Uh, supporting young people and equipping them with coping mechanisms that are, as I would describe, healthy habits or habits that uh, will promote um, engagement or lead to better outcomes. So in terms of how we promote and how we equip these young people with, you know, the skills essential to assist them if they are having troubles with substances um, or prevent, prevention is always the key, is by helping them to stay connected. So whether they're in a school, whether they're in a work environment, whether they're um, in the, uh, I guess, tertiary education, it's about ensuring that there are some people or some support services available to them when things start getting out of control. So it doesn't always necessarily need to be a professional. Generally, it'll start off with a family or a friend. Um, and what this person may notice is some um, habits that keep occurring over time. So this person may, partake in riskier behaviours or they may um, 
you know, disengage from work or from school. So once you start noticing these risk factors, that's kind of the time where you want to intervene. Um, if you're a friend supporting someone that seems to be having challenges with mental ill health or substance abuse. If you're the young person yourself and you notice that you're slowly losing control, um, you notice that you're making poorer choices, these decisions, it's very difficult to um, actually be able to understand that you might need that support. So that's why having those people around you as a, as a sort of measure to help put you back on track is very important. Some other things that um, will support you or are healthier coping mechanisms are remaining engaged in some sort of community involvement. So whether it's a sporting club, whether it's a religious group, whether it's some form of practice that helps ground your week so that you're able to see similar people or build connections outside of what you might regularly be used to. So by trying to provide this holistic approach um, or this balanced approach to your life, you, I, based on my observations and professional experience, you're less likely to fall through the cracks because if you're seeing these people at sport, um, they're able to keep you accountable or notice any um, deficiencies or any sort of impact that you might be experiencing so my biggest advice to young people is having balance and having people in your life that will sort of look out for you when I guess when you can't look out for yourself thank you thank you thank you so much Ismail um, what are some healthy ways the youth can cope with challenges as opposed to substance abuse Okay, I'm not sure. Ismail, are you there? Hello, can you hear me clearly? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. So as I mentioned earlier, I think the best advice here for non-drugs users is abstinence. But those who have already taken the drugs, the best way they can cope with some of these challenges as opposed to abuse, one is adopting proper hygienic conditions. Adopting proper hygienic condition will aid a better living for these drug misusers. And secondly, is to develop better sleep habits to avoid fatigue or malfunctioning of the brain. And also, these drug users most times abuse substances due to stress or emotional depression. So one of the practices they should ad adopt is to learn how to relax their mind so that they can let go of their stress and resentment. And also, if they interact with positive minds, that's the non-drug users, it will be beneficial to them greatly and it will prevent them from getting the psychosocial effect of these drugs. And I think proper taking of medication legally with prescription can also help this. Hello? Yes, we're listening. Go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. And as I was saying, proper taking care of medication and uh, among these youth can also help them to, to cope with some of the healthy challenges of these drug, drugs, especially those who have nicotine that creates the addiction among the youths. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Edwin, what would you like to add? Healthy what ways, some... yes. the healthy ways that youth, youth can use uh, is a way of coping. First and foremost, uh, I would want to mention that in most cases, if not all cases, substance use and ex rather substance abuse happens with, comes along with when somebody encounters or experiences frustrations. So the first thing that I would advise the youth, and this is to the youth, avoid frustrations. Frustrations like what? Relationships, okay? Frustrations like what? When you want to achieve something in life, all right? See, this is how it happens, uh, Madam Katinda. When you set goals, when you set, I want to achieve this, this is the person I want for my life, this is my partner, and you don't reach the target, that gap between your goal and where you are, that gap is very dangerous. And this is what brings about frustrations. So by always and means, Try to minimize the gap between your goal and where you, I mean, you understand what I mean? That you have a goal to have completed your studies by this period of time, or you expect to have attained a job, to have acquired a job, and you don't get it. See it, 
expect it and be prepared psychologically that this is likely to happen and this is how I'm going to mitigate. These are the measures that I'm going to put in place so that I don't become frustrated. That is number one. Number two, who is your support network? Do you have a mentor? Do you have somebody to work with? Who are you associating yourself with? Are you with the right kind of people? We normally say, show me your friends and I'll easily tell your character. So who are you associating with? Be very careful. Finally, uh, always remember that when you experience, when you know that you are now not in the using stage, you have now started abusing the substance. I said there are three levels. The first one is the use. Second one is the abuse. Third one is the one that leads to addiction. When you realize that it is not now using normally, that you are using abnormally, and that I, I actually say that abuse is derived from those two words, abnormal use, A, B for abnormal and use. So when you realize that you are abusing these substances, always know there is help awaiting. Always know that there is a healthy way, there is a professional approach that you can use to overcome the challenge. Don't sit there fallen, don't fall and remain down. Then it's also very important to, 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 to keep yourself busy. It's also very important for us. To, are you hearing me? Am I, am I audible? Yes, yeah, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. You keep yourself busy. Always make sure that you have proper time management. You know what to do after this, after that. And this way, you're busy throughout. You'll not be able to be idling. Stay healthy. Eat a well-balanced diet, a good nutrition. Do those physical exercises. Of course, like for example, if you are if you are in smoking and you start doing the exercises, the lungs will re reject the substances. So stay healthy, do your physical exercises, and always be empathetic. For those who are in these problems, know that it's not there. Which those who are already in problems, be empathetic because the moment you are empathetic. It's a self-defense mechanism because you wouldn't want to be in the position they are in. So uh, it's very important for us to stay healthy, keep off the substances. I said initially it is voluntary, but coming out of it, I can bet you'll suffer. Thank you and back to you, Katin. Thank you. I know that's a, that's a very good message again, right there, you know, telling them, emphasizing on the fact that it is a choice when you start any substance abuse, but the hardest part is when you become an addict. How do you yes. get yourself out of it? That is a very tough one. It needs a lot of willpower, a lot of support, a lot of, I guess, um, help from a lot of different professionals as well. So how can we promote awareness on the dangers of substance abuse? Men. I love that um, what you said, Edwin, there, show me who your friends are and I'll show you who you are. We actually have a similar sort of saying in the Turkish language, so I, I really like that and I think it rings true. Um, I think the where you're talking about the choice, um, I agree, but what it is, it's an uninformed choice. It's a choice where you don't actually understand the ramifications of the, the particular course of action that you're taking. So... In addressing this question, it's probably going to seem like a bit of a no-brainer. Um, working in a school and having all these young people come through the education system, it just seems um, it seems the right choice to actually have something within the curriculum to expose these children. Um, and you know, the way that that's implemented is obviously contingent on the research. But having these young children able to understand and these young people, young adults understand the impact that substances have on them. And it's not just alcohol that we're talking about. We're talking about cigarettes. We're talking about prescription medication. We're talking about antidepressants. We're talking about illicit drugs. So these young people, um, and my, my experience in this um, industry is mm -hmm. that someone will be experiencing mental ill health and they will, as a result, um, choose to or when they speak to their GP, look at antidepressants or a medicated approach. And what happens is, and what I've noticed is, these young people start experiencing the side effects of something that is actually perfectly legal, but when it's not equipped with the knowledge and the support, it actually has the opposite impact on their well-being. And suddenly they're um, they're not able to regulate and they're not able to 
proceed with their day-to-day -day function and won't actually exacerbate the situation. So the way that we, I guess, provide young people or equip young people, equip young people with the knowledge is really in school settings. Um, when students obviously fall through the cracks and are engaged in school, you know, it becomes quite hard to actually give them that, that education. So something that we need to consider in the workforce is how do we um, monitor you know, workplace practices or workplace culture around going for a drink or um, engaging in that sort of conduct. So it, it's a tricky one, um, you know, given how much reach the schooling and education system has, I would definitely say that's the first point of call. Second point of call, he healthcare providers, um, your local GP, and then hopefully just being able to share that knowledge um, through the community. So great question, but it's, it's a very tough, um, challenge. Yes, for sure, for sure. Ismail, can you can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you clearly. Okay, thank yes. you very much. So, what is your take on how do you promote awareness on the dangers of substance abuse? All right, and one of the ways to promote awareness on the dangers of substance abuse is by planning or attending local events such as rallies, conferences, or workshops that gives sensitization and awareness to the, of the effect of abusing substances, and also encourages youth to attend this workshop on conferences to enlighten them on the hazards and effects of misusing these drugs. Secondly, share your experience or information on social media or other platform. If you or your loved one has suffered from drug addiction, your story can be a powerful tool to help raise awareness about the dangers of misusing these drugs. I think if you can support, give moral or financial support to local organization whose mission is to educate the public about the addiction, prevention and recovery of drugs, it will also be a great advantage to drug, to you, to you who are fond of misusing the substances. And finally, public awareness is another tool that can create awareness or reduce the misuse of these psychoactive drugs. Educating the public on the nature of the disease of addiction, its associated cause and how to reverse the harm caused by this addiction, it greatly reduce the effects of these substances on drug users. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Adrian, how would you like to add to that? Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I'm building on what uh, my brother Ismail and Matt have mentioned. Uh, my, my look at it is that I Okay, we, your sound has disappeared, Edwin. I would recommend that uh, for us to promote awareness. Hello, Katrina. Hello, yes, can you can hear, hear me? You now. Yes, we can now. Okay, okay, thank you and sorry for that. I was saying that uh, I, I would suggest, I would uh, request of us to invest more on research. Let's get to know what is working and what is not working. There are those old ways that we used to, to use to promote prevention, whereby we used to use a scary messages, pictures that are so, but nowadays they are not working. Let's get research and get to know what is working, what is effective, especially for this target group, because the needs of this target group will differ from the target group of these other ones. So first, let's uh, invest more on research. Let's get to know what is working. Scientific, we use the scientific and evidence-based evidence -based practices. Step number two is to build capacities of the caregivers. It's very important that we keep on uh, building the capacities. Let, them, let, let us empower our guidance and counseling uh, specialist, those who are, let, let's do more and more, just like my brother mentioned about the conferences and the seminars and the workshops, let's get to empower uh, our, our staff and our working, uh, the caregivers. Then uh, definitely we should increase more programs. I'm really happy for Jimha. I'm really happy for the brains behind what we are doing today, because this is exactly what we are saying, that we know for sure our youth are more into social media and you decide to bring this topic on social media where they can easily reach it. This is promoting awareness. This is very key. And I would urge the brains behind this to keep on doing this. The summit that we have, let's all attend our youth. 
very soon we are going to have a summit. This is what we need to promote awareness. For us to know that we have a monster amongst us, we have a, a giant that needs to be addressed by all of us. Then the aspect of collaborative partnership. When you're there and this other person is there, let's work towards one goal. Let's not duplicate efforts, okay? And uh, the other thing is about uh, the government policies, wherever and in whichever government that you are in, let the government advocate for abstinence. Let that awareness be reached because there is that political goodwill in all these efforts that we are doing. We have institutional policies. Let all the institutions, be it a school, be it a college, be it a workplace, let's have workplace policy on prevention, work, workplace policy on uh, treatment. Let's, because unless we do, we approach it this way, then we are going to sing the same song today, yesterday, and the day after. Then finally, the best way for promoting awareness is taking that individual responsibility. Know that it's for your own good. Know that somebody is watching on you. Know that the younger sister, the younger brother, they are at home. Okay, you disappeared again, Edwin. Is Edwin, yes. Go ahead, you disappeared before. I, I'm sorry, I, I said, I talked about the government policies, I talked about the institutional policies, and also the individual responsibility, whereby it is an individual responsibility. Know that somebody is looking up to you. Know that somebody is watching your steps. Know that you are a model. Are you modeling for good or you're destroying the society? So in as much as we talk about government policies, remember you have an individual responsibility. Before you point a finger, what have you yourself done towards promoting wellness in the society that you come from? I'm sorry for the short uh, interference that occurred, but thank That's you. Okay. Thank That's you, okay. Thank you. So before we conclude, I know there's so many ways to protect and manage your mental health and well-being. So, ma'am, what is one thing you do for yourself on a daily basis to check in with your mental health and soothe your soul? Yeah, I have a I have a three stage approach. So every day it's part of my regular practice, um, and it's actually an idea I got from the Resilience Project. I don't know if any of you have heard of the Resilience Project. Yes. But if you haven't, um, please purchase the book or look it up on YouTube um, and see what Hugh's doing over there. So um, mindfulness is a regular part of my day, whether that's going for a walk, whether that's taking time to just observe my surroundings and really deeply think about what um, I'm seeing. Another part is being grateful. So gratitude, understanding what I'm grateful for on that given day. So being able to um, pick something different each time. So it might be something that I'm proud of myself of. It might be someone that I've got in my life that I'm very happy to have, um, things like that. The other one is empathy, which I'll regularly practice if that's a situational one though. So if, if um, I'm experiencing something, I try and put myself in a different position. The only other one that I do on a regular basis is exercise. I think that's incredibly important for mental sharpness and just being able to decompress after a long day. So that, yeah, that's what keeps me mentally healthy. And that's what I always preach to my students. Thank you. Thank you. What about Ismail? What are some things you do on a daily basis to manage your, um, to manage and protect your mental health and well-being? Uh, thank you very much. And the first thing I always do on a daily basis is to adopt a better sleeping habit to avoid brain fatigue. And um, also, I always... Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, and, and oh, okay, thank you very much. And I also engage myself in regular exercise to strengthen my muscles. I think that is very important again for me. And then also I make sure to always interact with non-drugs users so that I can't be influenced by them. And uh, and I and I make sure to balance, take a well-balanced diet to avoid munchies or hunger, constant hunger. 
I think those are some of the things I do, do on a regular basis. Thank you. For strengthening my mental well-being. Thank you. What about Edwin? What are some things you do, or what is one thing you do every day um, to manage Thank your mental you. health and well-being? Thank you. Thank you, Katinda. Of late, I have adopted the physical exercise. I'm doing a lot of jogging, early morning jogging, so that uh, I, it helps me keep fit. I also, like I've said before, engaging with positive-minded people because uh, these negative uh, minded people can really intoxicate your brains and you turn out your output becomes compromised. So it's always good to engage with the right kind of people like Katinda, the way we okay, engage we lost and my brothers, this kind of engagement is very therapeutic for me. Thank you and back to you. Yeah, I believe this is healing for us as much as we are here being part of a show where we are informing, inspiring, educating, and giving more insight. It also works for us because we're listening, we are talking, we're also healing. It's a healing process. I believe it's just, okay. it's everything is about healing. So if we of can course. talk about it, it's helping us to heal as well. So now, if you want more information Absolutely. about the mental, global youth mental health awareness, you can find us on our, you can visit the website, www.globalyouthmentalhealthawareness.org or you can email jude at jimha.org. Now, if anybody wanted to send to you a message, what, uh, where can they find you, ma'am? Are you on social media? Are you, where are you? Yeah, so just my name, um, ma'am, it's Kavla Kola. I'm on LinkedIn, um, or you can find me on Instagram with that name. Thank you. How about Edwin? Where can people find you? Thank you. Thank you, Katinda. Uh, you, on social media, you search for Kibe Edwin Gitao. K-I-B-E Edwin E-W-E-D-W-I-N-G-I-T-A-U. Kibe Edwin Gitao. You'll find me on Instagram. You'll find me on Facebook. You'll find me on LinkedIn. I also have a website. Okay, www.uhai www center. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. My website is www.uhaicenter.org, U-H-A-I-C-E-N-T-R-E dot O-R-G. And I'm an ambassador, Jimha ambassador. Always search for me on the Jimha social media handles. Thank you and back to you, Katinda. Thank you. Ismail, what about you? Where can people find you? Okay, thank you very much, Katinda. I'm using Ismail Ghazali Bangura on my Instagram account. And on LinkedIn, I'm also using that name, Ismail Ghazali Bangura. And um, I'm residing in Freetown, Sierra Leone, West Africa, and the Central Medical Stores Pharmacy Board of Sierra Leone as a regulatory and quality control analyst. And my email address is Ismail Ghazali Bangura at rocketmail.com. Thank you, and back to you, Katinda. Thank you, thank you. So before we go, I just want you guys to give us what is one thing, a very quick, short, maybe not very long explanation. What is one thing people who are watching this show today need to do as soon as they finish watching, watching this show? Ma'am. Um, if you're watching this and you've been thinking about doing something for a long time, um, the first step is always the hardest, but it's also the most important. So don't be afraid, uh, take a step into the unknown. Um, and if you need help, make sure you engage someone to help you. Thank you. Ismail, what's one thing you can leave our viewers with today? Something they can take action right away. And uh, for the viewers watching us at the moment, for those who, are in, who have been engaged in taking these drugs, I think the best thing they should do is to abstain or talk with your counsellors so that they can help them get out of these effects or reactions from the drugs. Thank you. Thank you. Edwin, what is one thing the viewers can take action on, inspired action, as soon as they finish watching this show today? As soon as you're through, as soon as we are through, always engage us. Ask questions on the chat board. We are there to assist you. There is help awaiting. Don't shy off. It's not only happening to you. Seek help and you'll get it. We are there. We will help you. That's the starting point. And accept where you are. And you'll get help and get it in plenty. Thank you, Katinda, and back to you. Thank you. Yes, I believe definitely um, if we're really 
wanting to get help, if you're watching this show, just as Edwin said, just seek help, ask for help. It's just what you do. It's one of those things you have to do that. Um, so I'm just saying here, we might have a question from some a viewer. We, I think we can answer this before we go. So there's a question here for someone who has been smoking for 21 years and wants to quit. How can such a person quit? Who wants to answer that question? I think I'll just make a quick comment. It's not always as simple as being able to go cold turkey the first time. It's not as much as we say um, abstain, zero tolerance. There's probably going to be multiple times where you try and stop. Um, the trick is to, you know, reward yourself for the small wins. So if you're able to abstain for a day, that's good. If you're, and then the next time, two days, three days, you got to work towards the ultimate goal um, that you're that you're looking at. But don't be too hard on yourself if you don't get it first time. Thank you. And then there's another one. I know some, someone says here, I know someone who has mental illness and anytime he wants to sleep, unless he has, he takes a drug called the blue five before he can sleep. So what is, what is the way out for this individual? Edwin, maybe. The way out for that individual is to seek, prof just like we are saying, go and look for a psychiatrist so that he can the, the person, the, the doctor can identify what the problem you are actually suffering from. And there is that proper medication that will assist you. Don't self-medicate because the moment you start looking for sleep using substances, it means there is something that you're running away from. And uh, look for that help. Then from there, uh, look for a psychologist who will assist you to change the patterns that you've been using. Change this person will teach you the sleep hygiene and, and this will be very helpful to you. There is a question that was asked there earlier about uh, how do I quit after 21 years of using? Let me tell you, I'll, uh, although I'm coming in late, let me tell you that the very first step in recovery, coming out of it is the one that you've done today, accepting that I have a problem and I want to come out of it. That is a very positive mindset. The next thing is be patient on yourself. Focus on getting rid of it. And of course, if you engage on the chat box, I'll keep you engaged and I'll give you more insights on how to overcome it. So it's, it's, a, it's a wide topic, but I'll go back to the chat box and you're going to share a lot. Thank you, Katinda. Okay. okay, we have, before we conclude, we have more, one more question. How can we incorporate spiritual health and well being into mental health? Ma'am. Yeah, this is a really good question because when you look at a person, an individual, you can't just separate their emotional health from their physical health, from their spiritual, from their mental. It's all related. It's all interlinked. Mm -hmm. What makes each person special is the fact that they're individual so that they have their own coping mechanisms. Um, for example, they might, they might perceive a situation from a, a certain religious learning or teaching um, and the way that they approach that coping mechanism might be based on some spiritual beliefs or it might be based on modern um, evidence-based practice. So really what you want is you want for, for a young person that has certain spiritual beliefs, you want to work with someone or be around like-minded people who have experienced similar challenges. So someone who can act as a peer mentor to help guide you through some similar challenges because I don't believe there's any one way to approach any sort of mental health, ill health challenge. What it comes down to is what works for you. And if spiritual health or your faith is something that you hold dear to you, then that's something that you need to incorporate in any sort of recovery. Thank you. Okay, I'm just seeing if to see. Let me see if we have any more questions or comments. I see there's a comment of someone saying here, sharing of lived experiences. So including service users and carers, caregivers in research, Practicing social contact also helps to address the stigmatization that is associated with mental health issues. Also, there's another comment. The medical dualism model has been advocated by medical anthropologists, integrating non-allopathic traditional spiritual practice into the orthodox allopathic medicine. Okay, so I think- Thank you, thank you. What that says is that, uh, sorry, can I, can I pass Go a ahead. comment? 
Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. What I'm, what, what, I'm, what that means and what uh, Matt has mentioned is that we okay, use yep. a multidisciplinary approach towards treatment and towards recovery. We use the, me, me, the what do you call it? The pharmacotherapy, we use the medicine, we use the psychotherapy, we use the spiritual therapy, we use the physical therapy. We use, there is no, in, in short, what I'm saying is that uh, science has proven that there is no specific route. There is no, uh, like the way we say that if you take two tablets of these, you'll get healed in five days. There is no such in, in recovery of mental health. You have to use multidiscipline approach. And this way, it gives way that you can use. And if the moment you combine all of them, the better for you so that you come out in a holistic way, you approach it in a holistic way, and you, 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 you end up being productive and you regain your personality. Thank you and back to you, Batinda. Just Edwin, just to clarify, when you say multidisciplined, what are you actually talking about? I'm talking about when you go to a psychiatrist, this person will prescribe medicine. When you have a mental condition, when you have substance use disorder, there, there are those prescriptions that, that will be uh, prescribed for you to undergo, to undergo detoxification. That is one approach towards recovery. Then there is the psychotherapy, whereby this person goes through a psychologist who will understand the thinking patterns, the way this person is approaching life. And this person will help you in bringing you back to normalcy. When you talk of spiritual therapy, remember there's a difference between spirituality and religion. In spirituality, we are addressing the higher power, something that is above, beyond your understanding, knowing that there is that superior power above you, you incorporate it. And then the physical wellness, you also go to the nutrition, the dietitian will also come in. You go to a physiotherapist. I mean, all this is the multidiscipline approach that I'm talking about. And eventually it leads to your restoration of your well wellness. Thank you, Katinda. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to make that clear. Did you, ma'am, did you want to make a comment? That's, that's summed up very well, thank you. Yeah, so I just wanted to get that clear because maybe the viewers watching when you say multidiscipline, it doesn't, it's not clear. So I just wanted to clarify that to make it sure that people understand that you need all these support systems to work all at once to support you and help you try to overcome this challenge. So we look like we've come to the end of the show today. Thank you for being here today, Edwin, Mehmet and Ismail, and for sharing your insights on substance abuse and young people. I want to thank you, You're our welcome. viewers. Yes, I want to thank you, our viewers, for being fabulous audience and for watching the Global Youth Mental Health Awareness Show. Until next time, uh, next fortnight, we don't have a topic yet. Until just check on our social media, we'll have a topic for the next fortnight. So until next time, may you all experience the frequencies of love and light. Stay blessed. Amen. And stay safe. And you too. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, thank you yeah. for giving us this platform to thank share you. ideas and knowledge. Thank you so much. It's highly thank appreciated. You. Thank you for being here today. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you too. Thank you too. Let me see. Okay. Bye-bye.